think we could probably get started. Sorry for the Zoom difficulties for the people on Zoom, but um, I'll leave the QR code up for like three more seconds. If anyone wants to scan it, just like let us know you're here. But I wrote made a schedule for tonight. Um, the first five minutes that just happened with for Zoom difficulties. And we have a bit of a discussion activity. And then next up, we have a bit of a workshop using screen readers. And then at the end, we have a presentation from Scout on the work that they've been doing so far this semester. Um, so yeah, those are my two slides for the show. <laughs> okay. Um, someone's in the chat right there. Oh, okay. It was a whole conference room. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Joanna. I'm the Vice President of Diversability. I'm unfortunately just a little under the weather at the moment, so I am um, in my dorm coming in via Zoom. Uh, Technology-wise, um, I'm gonna, I can talk a little bit about what I use, and then if our other members don't really have much else, we can talk about general accessibility things. But for me personally, um, I am unable to handwrite. Uh, and so I happen to use technology quite often to take notes on things that people wouldn't expect. So like I use technology to take like math notes. And so being able to have systems that can work um, in all scenarios is very important. Also things being able, things that are easy, if we're talking just like mechanical, the mechanical function of technology, things that are like easy to open and use. Um, keyboards, those nice clicky mechanical keyboards that everyone love. Yeah, they're really hard for me to use because you have to push down really hard and my hands just can't really do it. And so they're really hard to navigate and really hard to develop. And so with a lot of accessibility stuff, there's honestly accessibility technology is a huge topic and is so many different disabilities have so many different needs and accommodations. But part of it is definitely ease of use, um, making things as easy and intuitive as possible is is very important and making sure that um, you're just trying your best to include and make sure that the mechanical functions are something that are easy to use for majority of people. Also, like this is a concept called universal design, I'm sure as many of you are aware. And that also, just because it helps me, it also might help other people uh, who may not necessarily be disabled, but in general, universal design makes all technology better because it forces people to think outside the box and think creatively. Um, so that is just kind of the basic overview of what I was thinking about it um, in general. I don't know if, what else our members are thinking. If not, we can talk a bit more about other aspects, but maybe let them talk more first. Yeah. 
question by I can't read on my textbook any kind of thing, so it's not saying it's a glory to my dedication. Uh, I can't read the book. Like, it, I don't do anything to combat it other than just not reading my textbook in the bed. Because, um, like, I know there's like the whole eight weeks of holy thing, but that's old. Yeah. Uh, and also, it's like, I'm not going to observe it because it's reading like complex physics. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's mostly just like my eyes can't focus on my eyes electronically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also true. That's why I don't buy things at the woods. They also take time to get there, and I wonder my text is there for four hours. Like, sorry. I was gonna say, I feel like that's kind of like kind of my felt. 
you can like inclusive design versus like accessible design mm -hmm. like if like the design website just lets you change it to like one other font size that's bigger right. that may help out one person but a more inclusive design would be like a brain different font size because that would right. help out a lot of people so. that's why i was going back to that it's like that's why i get frustrated with laptops because laptops tend to have a lot less settings especially for visual things um than like just having a separate monitor but you can like adjust every setting under the sun on a monitor, but laptops you can just adjust the brightness and it really bothers me. Because <laughs> like it's not hard to in, like put in those settings, but they just make it difficult. Okay. Joanne, do you want to talk about universal design at all or anything? Sure. Oh uh so um, universal design, I, we, I brought up briefly earlier, but I'm sure many of you are aware because I know most of you are like engineers, like design people, but just in case you don't, um, universal design is the concept that all design, whether it be architecture, technology, just all design should be accessible to all people completely, universally. It's universal design. It is designed that universally works for everyone. Um, so that would mean things like every website should have... Um, a format that would work for say uh, speech readers, text readers. I don't, uh, again, I'm not, I don't know how much knowledge you guys have. So I'm just gonna assume none just cause it's probably easier that way. Um, I'm sure you guys do know, but um, people who are blind or low vision will often use what's called a screen reader, which is this application that will read out the words on the screen. Small problem, most websites are not built for that. And actually another fun fact, most companies that market themselves as like, we'll make your website screen reader friendly, also do not do that and actually do a very poor job of doing that. You also need to have things like image descriptions so that people, so again, so that blind people could uh, read the image description and see what it says. Um, things like fonts, uh, this is mostly within the tech realm in general, like computer tech uh, fonts, like dyslexic friendly fonts and colors that are friendly, making sure that your colors aren't like contrasting and so that people who are colorblind can see as well. And then for more mechanical stuff, making sure that your things, if you have to open something, if someone has to pull something, making sure it either has a way that you could hook onto it and pull it without necessarily having to use like a grip your hand or also making sure at the same time that it has a grip because I don't know about the rest of you. I have absolutely zero grip strength. I can barely open water bottles because of my disability. Um, and so, there are a lot of products that aren't necessarily well designed for that stuff. I have to ask my roommate to open up my medication bottles, um, the ones I get at CVS. Uh, it's not all of them, but uh, this is actually a very big thing, um, design with medication bottles. Um, the ones they give me at CVS, I physically cannot press down hard enough to twist it off. So I have to ask my roommate to do it. And so these are just like some examples again there's a lot of examples of it but it is something to keep in mind and i'm gonna be honest you're not when doing universal design you're not going to be able to hit everything honestly very difficult because there are so many different types of disabilities but making your products in a way that is accessible at least to a couple groups of disabilities preferably as many as possible but again not necessarily feasible making your products accessible to a large group of people does genuinely benefit everyone, everyone, it really does. It just in general makes society more creative and also just benefits all people. And also you never know when you're gonna become disabled. Most elderly people are disabled. And so to start creating products and technology now that may benefit current disabled people also in the, in the selfish way will probably benefit you in the future when you are older. Yeah, and I think also like then people are trying to build accessible features into technology. The best way to do it is to do it like a lot of companies don't do that and they just do like they're like prefer like doctors or researchers or subjects to see what like they should include for accessibility features. And a lot of them don't actually ask the disabled people. Um so when you get that like immediate feedback from someone Disabled, you're gonna make a much better product, like you will actually know what you're looking for. Where it's like 
wait for Drupal for I think um, 20 hours. It has like um like this is a part that has like glasses in it. Yeah. Oh, you can do triangle or square. Oh yeah, so like this is a part that's like triangle here or square. Oh. Yeah, so you can the differences between the two. That's cool. Oh, this is the first. It was also the first time that I've seen that was like actually the first oh I'm so sad. But yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really seen like how like like wide spots are like showing off those like little pieces of um, pattern. I don't think it's like a new thing. I don't think it's like 15 hours. I think it's like 30 hours. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't really, my virtual is only effective if it's not really. So um, as Marley was saying, like when I'm really relying on Computers and other things like that. Um, but I link no in speaking to like other people in general and also just like I don't know if you would consider this technology or like equipment, but I mean this is obviously like a manual worker equipment, but there's also like debate over whether you know Marley power is technology or a time consuming too. But it's just I feel like assistive technology in general is just so unrealistically expensive. Oh, yeah, um, also insurance. Yeah, it doesn't cover it. Yeah, so I'm going to Yeah. Which Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, it's great if you're creating accessible technology and everything like that, but if the disabled people who you're creating it for can't afford it, there's kind of no point. And also, we know that. Disabled people are more likely to be in poverty and be homeless, but kind of can think about as well. So it's just kind of a really hard situation. Like, it's really great hearing about like different perspectives because, like, as like an older large person, like I definitely think like the PBS prescription models. Like I get prescription from PBS, and I I never noticed like that. Yeah. Yeah. I hate those bottles so much. I've actually started putting them into my old um, medication bottles, which is something a lot of people do if they ha get a medicine bottle that works for them. A lot of disabled people um, will then transfer them in to the different bottle just because then I don't have to ask my roommate every time I need to take my meds to open a bottle. Well, have you ever tried like jar openers or something? Like no, yes, I have. I have jar openers. It's because you need force downward and at the same time, anything that you have to push down and press in on the side at the same time, terrible. I'm sorry. I understand their child locks. I get it. But I am basic, functionally in this case a child because I can't open them either. And so I cannot stand those kinds of things to open because they're so difficult and like they just don't work for me. And also think of like the mental, not necessarily humiliation, but how it feels mentally to know that I can't open my own medication and that I have to ask someone every time like I need to open a new bottle of pills. That's not like great. That's not something, that's not like a nice feeling to have because medication is something that I need every day and it shouldn't be something that I have to like ask to even open when it, when there's a very easy solution out there. And just one last thing, a major thing for having accessible taxes to support your courage independence. A lot of disabled people crave independence because you have to ask for help with so many things. So when you look through accessibility features, it is good, you know, for physical reasons, but also mentally, because it makes you feel more empowered, more independent. Have you seen those medicine bottles that are like, there's like two arrows on the top of the bottle and you have to line it up? And then I hate yes, those are slightly better, at least for my specific disability needs. Those are better. I have like a couple of those. My preference. Hold on. I have it right here. I have a medicine bottle right here. Very convenient is the ones for me personally that have these little tabs that you push down because once you push it down, this cap just twists really easy. 
Um, and that the push for me, the push down is easy, but that's not necessarily true of all disabilities. That is my preference. The lot, the arrows do work as well. It's just the ones you have to go like that. Don't <laughs> do not work. Same thing with mouse wash. Mouth wash is really hard to open. <laughs> Oh, I missed the chat. Okay, we'll try and speak up a bit for the people on Zoom. Sorry about that. Okay, great. So we have a bit of a workshop um, on using screen readers. And the goal of this workshop is to kind of just try and practice identifying accessibility bugs, not necessarily in the code, but like actually on the website and things that you notice that are broken. And um, kind of just like getting comfortable with using a screen reader if you haven't used a screen reader before. So what you will need for this workshop is a laptop. So if you do have a laptop, it would be great to pull it out. And if you don't have one, maybe try and sit near someone that has one. It would be great. Oh, dear, I missed the thing. That's my dad's That's like my dad's computer. You want any of you? It was also cheaper than all the shoes I Oh, it's one one. Yes. Yeah, I was going to point that out. Um, okay, so for your laptop, you'll need Google Chrome. And you can either use a text editor, which I know like all Macs have, or if you are a computer science student or like engineering student, if you have like some type of development environment, you can use that. And if you don't have either of those, um, I'll show you on the file. If you double click the HTML, you can just open it up to Google Chrome. Um, not one of multiple laptops couldn't have set that up. But um, everyone can go to this link. It's bit.ly slash uh, forward slash multi dash ally, but the L's are ones. So A11Y. One, one, And I'll speak a bit more about the setup, and then there's a bit of a warm up exercise, and then we can get into some of the workshop bits. Everyone got the link? Actually, it's on the it's on the thing I was showing as well. Link is bit dot slash bit dot ly slash multi dash a one one one. You didn't get it. Okay, so the setup is there is a file at this link, and you can download it and unzip it. And there will be an index.html file there, and you can open on Google Chrome uh, by double clicking it, or you can open it in your development environment or in your text editor. And we basically import a screen reader into this file, which you can use to navigate the website. Oh yeah, I said that. You can open the file. It's uh, so it's the it's the bolded of this. Yeah. 
Do you need, do you mean the Google Doc file or like the? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, you can click on the this and that'll open it up. Okay, great. Yep. And then you can open it in text editor IDE, which is where we'll make the changes. But um, if you aren't familiar with like code or pure science, you can also just look at the bugs on the website, which I'll explain a bit more. Um, and just to talk a bit more about screen readers, I know like Joanna touched on them a bit, but it's basically an application that will help people with visual impairments use their computer. And basically by using like keys on the keyboard, uh, it'll basically read out the content to you that's on the page. And like Joanna was saying, you know, not all websites are built to read all the content out of the page. Um, so it's always necessary and like really helpful, like for computer science people who are making the code for this website to include, you know, the certain code that will read it out on the website. So yeah. So there's a bit of a warm up to just get the hang of the screen readers. So um, it may be tempting, but um, don't use your mouse. Just try and use the keyboard as much as you can. And basically I included what the keyboard shortcuts are to navigate on the website. Is everyone on the website right now? I have a question. Yeah. What screen are we pressing? I can. I like to see a little. So, oh yeah, the I don't know that thing there. Yes, that thing. Oh, Anyone else need help setting up the Okay, if you turn up your volume, you'll hear like the page speaking to you. There's also, I think, a volume like slider on the bottom. All right, I hear it, so it should be working. <laughs> Is there a way to like change? Oh, you can change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's like both. Also, there's like a Alex. There's also different languages. Which I think like Alice is Spanish or what? Okay. Before everyone starts playing around with it, let me explain a bit more. Then you can continue playing around with it. But um, there's a few things that if you wanna try exploring, like selecting the buy button, navigating the website. Um, you can just try and see if you can go through each item. And after you play around with it for a bit, you'll probably notice that there's a few bugs on purpose. And um, it'll be good to note them down for the exercises. So basically, there's in each um, like numbered section, there's a bug. And it basically talks a bit about um, if you notice the bug. And um, we can kind of go through later how to fix it. Um, and with code, you can also look up if you are like computer science, so you can look at the HTML documentation that'll explain how to fix the code. But also, if you aren't familiar with code, just try and notice the bugs that um, are on the page. I'm sure they'll be easy to notice because like certain things either won't speak or certain things you can't tab over. But there's like tabbing errors, um, there's alternative text errors, some buttons are broken, and there's also label issues. So um, I think it's. Okay, I'll give everyone about like five, 10 minutes, like go through the website, play around with it, get familiar with the screen reader. And if you see any bugs, things that are broken, uh, point them out and then we'll come back together and talk through the solutions and the fixes. But yeah. Out the screen reader, feeling out the bugs and such. Um, now I'll go through each of the areas that we noticed that there was bugs in. Did anyone notice any areas in tabbing? Yes. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Joey. Joey, yes. It doesn't tab over the hand page. Yes, interesting. I noticed that as well. Does anyone know a fix for this? Yeah, so I'm a computer scientist, so it's kind of cheating here, but um, so under the jar item, there's no attribute for a tag index. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't know that like the next time you hit time that it should select that. Yes, that's exactly what happens. So if anyone wants to fix it in the HTML code, you can add a tab index as one of the attributes and it'll fix it for you.
alternative text. Did anyone notice when you like tabbed over a certain element, it didn't say exactly what the image should be? Yes, yeah. So, uh, all right. Yeah. So, I can't, I don't know what happened at all. Okay. But, no worries. Um, it says the Shopify, it just says icon here. Yes. And so it's like it's like on the right hand side. Yeah. Like, you know what a good fix stuff for that would be? Um, I guess if you just know HTML, like you can like go to that specific image mm -hmm. and you can just change, or maybe you can add all stuff. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That was also one example. Another example that didn't have um, alternative text on it was the photo with the dice. So if you, um, in HTML, if you add the attribute alt, um, when the image doesn't work, it'll say the words in the alt tag, I mean, attribute, and then the screen will also read it out. So yeah. Anyone notice any broken buttons? I gave it away, there are broken buttons. <laughs> But yes, there were broken buttons. And oh, I went too far. But yes, some buttons were not focusable or clickable. So specifically the um, the shopping cart icon was just an icon, not actually a button. So if you change the div element to a button element, solve our problem. Then lastly, ARIA labels. Um, Specifically, ARIA labels are used for assistive technology, and the um, ARIA label on the shopping cart image button was not working. So by adding the ARIA label on the shopping cart image, it helps it out because if people can't see that there's an actual shopping cart on it, you can't tell it's like for buying something. So by adding the label buy, it says on the button, it reads out the word buy. So yeah. Um, yeah, this was just meant to be like a short intro into using screen readers, trying out, you know, trying to fix the bugs, noticing the bugs, things like that, just as like a little intro. Um, we'll include these slides in our newsletter if you're um, subscribed to it. And this is just some more resources to, you know, continue learning, continue talking about these things outside of our meeting. Um, and yeah. So, I'll hand it over to Scout to continue. You want to mute on this so that it's live. Yes, perfect. Yes. Oh. Okay, so um, I am Catherine and I'm a project lead on Scout this semester. So we're really excited that we like, got to do this collaboration and talk to you about how we're trying to make Scout more accessible. Um, so Scout Studio is the section of Scout that does client projects. So they'll have like a client for the semester. And a lot of times those um, client requests are websites. So that is where having a system of accessibility is really important. So my studio team this semester has just been working on standardizing those practices so that um, 
we have a solid system in place. So um, this is just an outline of what I'll talk about. We covered the why pretty clearly, I think, in the, um, in the exercise and with diversity speaking. Um, but then I'll just talk about our system and how we set it up. We're still in the process. Um, and then I have a few inspirational designers and resources at the end that I think are doing very cool things in this area. Um, but yeah, this is stuff that we talked about, but accessibility and, and inclusivity um, is just working towards ensuring that no target user of your product is going to be excluded um, and also taking into account human diversity. So that's kind of the inclusivity part, like making sure that, um, you know, it's not only catering to disabilities, but also if people are in different parts of the world, speak different languages, like if they're part of your target user, they should be able to use your product. Um, and that doesn't mean like having the same system for everybody to accomplish the task, but giving people options, like we were talking about the option to like turn off styling, um, just giving people options to make the experience what they need it to be. Um, and yeah, like we also said it enhances experiences for everybody. Um, I put a few examples, but designing for people with low vision also helps people that are in the bright sunlight and trying to read their phone. Um, making things screen readable um, in that format also makes the visual hierarchy visually better. So um, yeah, it really makes the experience better for everybody. And that is why we should in, like try to make products as accessible as possible. So when we were starting the semester, we looked into what already existed within Scout. There was an accessibility workshop that um, was put on to educate people um, about some of the like standards and rules and processes, and then also using um, plugins such as Stark for Figma, which help um, touch some accessibility things like contrast. Um, then we did research, we did interviews, um, looked at other companies' guides. Um, so like Airbnb, Apple, Google, they post their accessibility guides for their designers and developers online. So we looked through those. And then we also looked at the creators of these rules. So WCAG is really well known, but there's um, lots of like checklists and guides out there that we looked at. But for the solution, we didn't want to just like give a link to one of these things. We wanted to make it work for Scout. Um, and that meant like choosing which standards are going to be most important to implement. There's so many things out there and a lot of them just like probably won't come up. So picking the ones that are most relevant and then finding the way to deliver that to Scout um, in a way that will make people want to or make people follow them. And since we're still developing this, we're hoping that next semester with the new Scout teams, we'll, they'll be able to um, do some sort of test with like one team or just see how it works and hopefully it does work. Um, but yeah, the solution we came up with is, um, first of all, a guide. So Scout basically runs everything through Notion. So we decided to just keep it there, which is where people are already used to finding all the information that they need. Um, so that's basically a checklist, and I'll show it in a minute. Um, and then reworking the workshop, making it, I guess, more potent and stick better. And then we're also thinking of doing a binder which would be more of like a flip through physical book with examples of why accessibility, how it helps people um, and more, I guess, less practical and more broad overview of the concepts. Um, and then external information that could be delivered in some way to clients and people that are looking to apply to Scout just so they know that accessibility is something that's important to Scout um, and how how we will ensure that in our projects. So I will show the guide um, that we've been working on. Oops, I should have had it up. So ignore all the, all the um, comments and stuff, but uh, basically just starting with a definition. Um, yeah, Northeastern, I feel like in some of my design classes we've touched on it, but it's been very like, just make sure that your contrast is like meeting the WCAG guidelines. So 
I we're not expecting people to come into Scout and like know about like know what accessibility is. So um, just giving a quick explanation. Um, also, the way this guide is set up, it's to meet AA compliance. There's basically three levels. Um, and AA is kind of the standard for most websites. Um, AAA is better, but it's very hard to like meet unless you're catering to specifically a group that would benefit from that. Um, this is our resources tab, which is also in the presentation. So I'll touch on that later. And then the design guide. So I presented it in two different ways. One is a checklist. I know this is probably how I would want to interact with it. Um, checking things off is like very helpful for me. So yeah, just if when in the design process, it came to picking colors, for example, the designer could open this and see the, the standards and also a quick blurb about like why these standards need to be met. And it's not just like, oh, we're trying to like really police your design. It's like, this is necessary because of this. Um, and then they're all more in-depth explained down here. And Notion actually allows you to sort. So it's sorted by importance, um, but if you want to sort it by the step of design that you're in, you could do that. And then each one is provided with a test. So, you know, if you're like, how do I know if my colors actually work? There is a test to um, self-check all of these items. And it is a lot of items, which is why I'm hoping that we can like test this out with a studio team and see if people actually want to follow this. Um, but yeah, each one opens up. It explains why you would need to follow this rule at what point in the process it comes up and then actually explains the rules and how to implement them as well as how to test them. And then this part is not put in here yet, but the like, transfer from design to dev is very important. Like we saw with the tabbing, um, if design has a specific order that they think that they like have designed the tab order to go in for what makes sense for the user process, they should indicate that for the developers so that the developers aren't just like guessing or going in the visual order if that's not how it's supposed to be. It should be, um, designers should indicate the best way for a user to tab through the site. Um, so yeah, we're still working on that section, which is why it's blank. But this is the dev guide. It's very similar, but we also formatted all of this into a pull request template, um, which is a little long, so working on that. But yeah, for it's very similar format, except with these snippets of code put in to um, help explain how to actually accomplish each, each standard. Um, and yeah, we, obviously this is a list of like 10 items. There's way more if you went to the WCAG website, but we tried to choose ones um, that are really the most important um, and that if you didn't have them, the site would just be unusable by some users. So yeah, it's just the, uh, I feel like any step towards making products more accessible is important um, instead of trying to get there all at once. But yeah, that is what we've been working on um, all semester. And we're hoping that other design clubs, other, other tech clubs will hopefully try and work on their own um, systems. And then, yeah, I was going to just share some people that I really like also distribute these slides um, with the other slides, but Sarah Hendren is someone that I have like loved ever since I heard about her. I think she really, she calls herself a humanist in tech. And I think she really um, proves that accessibility can be a source of innovation. And I think that like the best like accessibility solves or like wins are ones where it's like, you're reinventing the whole process to make it better for everybody. And she, really does that. I think her work borders on like tech design and art. Um, like for example, she did the like, she helped, I think it was in Boston doing the like wheelchair um, like person that's like actually looks like they're moving instead of just like standing up and like covered up a bunch of them. So I actually saw one of those the other day and I was like, oh, that was Sarah Hendren. 
Um, so yeah, I love her. Absolutely recommend checking out her website. Forrest Young is a brand designer. Um, he's really focused on just designing for an inclusive future, um, designing for everybody. I love this quote from him that says, there is an urgent need for guardrails to ensure that future design or any kind of design pedagogy isn't framed by a privileged perspective or overly focused on either the historical or the future. This is um, an article interview with him. Um, and yeah, I think he has a very like down to earth, clear headed perspective on design. And then Bojana is an art access consultant. So she helps museums, galleries, ex other artistic experiences, um, make them more accessible to people um, with disabilities. And she especially focuses on low vision. So one of her most recent projects was making alt text more beautiful sounding because it can sound kind of robotic. And um, yeah, so it's like, I think it's called the alt text poetry project. She's very cool. Um, and yeah, I also highly recommend checking out her website. And then on the last slide, I just put a, a list of resources. Um, there are a few of these are like checklists of, of accessible design and development, um, but Humane by Design and UX for the Next Billion Users and this um, Digital Accessibility Handbook um, all go really into like why accessibility matters, what is inclusivity and um, how we can design and how we can de design tech that just makes the world a better place. So yeah, I'll make sure that these slides get up to everybody. Thanks, Catherine. It's great to hear from like the people who are directly affected by, you know, the lack of this accessible and inclusive design and then also hearing from the people, you know, trying to combat that and working in, you know, that area. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks so much, you guys. Yeah. That was really fun. Cool. Well, that's it. That's it for me. Okay. Thanks yeah. everyone for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um,